Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Laura Peel, Director of Information Technology and your technology moderator. Committee members, I want to take a roll call to verify that audio communication is working. Please say present to indicate you can hear me. Now please mute your device until you are called on to speak. <clears throat> McCabe. Present. Mike McCurick. Present. Bob Dillinger. Present. Commissioner Seal. Not on. Rick Butler. Is not on and, and that concludes the committee. I thank you now I'll turn it over to our CEO, Beth Houghton. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Beth Houghton, CEO at the Juvenile Welfare Board. This finance committee meeting of the Juvenile Welfare Board of Pinellas County is being conducted remotely consistent with Florida Governor DeSantis's executive order 20-69 of March 20th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency throughout the state of Florida given the outbreak of the novel coronavirus COVID-19. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the state to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order EO 20-69 suspends the requirement of the Sunshine Law to have all meetings in a specific public place and to require a quorum to be present in person. EO 2069 has been extended by EO 20-150. These executive orders posted on the JWB's public notices website allows public bodies to utilize communication media technology to conduct its business. <clears throat> this meeting, JWB is convening via Zoom webinar and telephone conference posted on our website, which clarifies how the public may join and participate. A public meeting notice was published in the Tampa Bay Times on June 17, 2020, as required by section 189.015 of the Florida statutes. Please note that this meeting is being recorded on Zoom webinar and YouTube live. Also, some attendees are participating by telephone conference. Participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording and will become part of the public records of the Juvenile Welfare Board of Pinellas County. Laura Peel, JWB Director of Information Technology will serve as the technology moderator of the remote participation of JWB board members, JWB staff, presenters, and public. Okay, permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Committee members uh, of the board, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Bernie McCabe. Here. Mike McCarrick. Here. Bob Dillinger. Here. <clears throat> Here. Commissioner Seal. Here. Rick Butler is not here. Uh, Chief Milliken. Here. Susan Ralston. Push your button, Susan. I'm here. And Colleen Flynn, board attorney. I'm here. Thank you. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Beth Houghton. Here. Laura Brock. Here. Judith Warren. Here. Linda Leedy. Here. Lynn Delator. Here. Diana Caro. Here. Laurie Lewis. Here. Thank you. Please mute your device until you are called on to speak. Okay. First item on the See, agenda. I need to I need to say a few more things, Bernie. Sorry about that. Okay. You know, keep, lawyers, keep, what can I say? Keep um, talking all, okay. All of the materials for this meeting are posted on JWB's website with the agenda for the meeting, and we recommend that JWB's committee members and all public follow the agenda as posted unless we note otherwise. We're now turning to the agenda, but before we do that, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The Finance Committee Chair will introduce each item on the agenda, 
And after staff has presented the item, the chair will, will entertain questions by the committee members. Please physically raise your hand in the Zoom webinar to be recognized. If you're on a telephone conference line, please press star nine so the moderator may unmute your line. We will have public comment before the vote on each action and during the open agenda. Please use the raise hand feature in Zoom webinar or press star nine if you're on a telephone conference line to be recognized to speak. The moderator will call on each person by name or the last four digits of the call-in number allowing three minutes for comment. And finally, each vote will be taken as a roll call vote. Further, for all participants, board members, staff, and the public, please remember to mute your phone or device when you're not speaking. And please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. With that, I turn the meeting over to Mr. McCabe, Chair of the JWB Finance Committee. Well, thank you. Uh, first item on the agenda is the minutes of the May 14th, 2020. Does anybody have any additions, corrections, or substitutions for those minutes? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? Mike McCurk mo moves to approve. Is there a second? Second. Dillinger seconds. Several people second. Uh, do we need to do a roll call vote on a minute? No. All in favor say aye. No, aye. aye. All opposed, same thing. Bob time. actually was, Bob actually was um, the, I was just trying to point to Bob to say he actually uh, made the motion. I wasn't there, so it probably doesn't make sense for me to make the motion. Bob actually made the motion. His, he was just on mute. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's clear now. All right. The next item is the Middle School Academy Award. If you remember, this is for Azalea uh, Middle School. Two people, two groups applied, only one survived. And that's Boys and Girls Club. Laura, you want to tell us what's going on there? Sure. Thank you. Uh, yes, so uh, the back in November of 19, the Finance Committee discussed uh, soliciting uh, additional site for the Middle School Academy. An RFP was submitted or released in January 10th, 2020, specifically for the Azalea Middle School. We had uh, two proposals that came in, the Boys and Girls Club of the Suncoast and the YMCA of Greater St. Pete. The evaluation committee reviewed those proposals and scored them the Boys and Girls Club of Suncoast with a weighted average score of 84. And the YMCA of Greater St. Pete, the uh, average score was 75.5. Both proposers were selected to be interviewed by the evaluation committee. Prior to the interview, the YMCA of Greater St. Pete withdrew their proposal due to time constraints. However, the interview did uh, proceed and the Boys and Girls Club of Suncoast were reevaluated after that interview by the committee and the reevaluated average score was 83. The evaluation committee then presented their recommendation to the executive team for consideration and the executive team is recommending to the finance committee to accept the evaluation committee's recommendation to award the Boys and Girls Club of Suncoast their budget request of a startup budget of 52,677 for fiscal year 20 and an annualized award of 310,547 beginning in fiscal year 21. Mr. McCabe. Okay, anybody have any questions of, of our CFO regarding this? Uh, Mr. McCure. Yeah, it's more of a comment. I wanted to thank both Lori and also Judith for following up on some questions I had about it. My concerns have been in the past specifically with, um, with Azalea and with the school system in supporting these efforts in the past. They've, they've not, let's just put it that way. The school system has had difficulties in supporting efforts like this. And I've watched too many of them fail. Uh, both Lori and, uh, and Judith have, have gone back to the school system, have talked to them, uh, it appears that they're bought into this program and that they're going to participate. Uh, and so as long as that happens, I'm, I'm comfortable. If we see some wavering going on there, uh, I ask that it be brought back to the, to the committee and to the board uh, because I'd hate to see these funds being spent and the, and the children not getting the value of this, of this program from it. Well, historically, Azalea has been a tough nut to crack for about the last two decades. So 
we wish them well. Is there any other comment or question regarding the Azalea Middle School program? Is there a motion to recommend the Azalea program to the, or the award to the Boys and Girls Club to the full board? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any comment, public or otherwise? I do not see any public comment. Okay, uh, roll call vote. Committee members, when I call your name, please state your vote. Bernie McCabe. Aye. Mike McCurick. Aye. Bob Dillinger. Aye. Commissioner Seal. Aye. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Back to the CFO, the May Financial and Investment Report. Thank you. I um, would like to share, let's see here. So the, the May financial statements were uh, accepted at the board meeting, but I wanted to just highlight a few items for you now that we are reviewing these statements at the finance, at the finance committee. So for the um, May, which is an eight month period for our fiscal year, you can see the balance sheet is uh, pretty solid. We've got $67 million in total assets, which the, the majority of that 61 million or about 91% of that is in cash and investments. On our liability side, we have a, 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 any, we don't have significant debt or liability, but we do have the pension liability of 4.1 million. And then the rest of our uh, balance sheet consists of the equity fund equity section. And just pointing out that we do uh, have a signed cash flow requirement, which is for the two month reserve that we set aside. And having said that, our unassigned fund balance amount of 11, 11 million currently represents 16.9% of our total fund equity. So again, we've got a pretty solid um, balance sheet. On the income statement, just a couple of things to point yeah. out. I had mentioned last month that the financial statements are presented on a modified cash basis. So as a result, all the revenues have pretty much been already uh, uh, recorded as revenues. So you can see on the revenue side, we have uh, spent or received 95% of our budget. But when you look at the expense side, if you look at our total programs for year to date, we're at 46%. You add in all the other expenses, so our total expenses are at 47.6%. So if you were to calculate eight months, eight of 12 months, that would be a 67% uh, amount, and we're at 47. If you look at a month to date basis, and I had pointed out uh, last uh, time that the current monthly financial statements are a function of taking the annual budget and dividing it by 12. And what we have proposed moving forward in next fiscal year is to do a better job allocating those expenses. We know in some of the summertime programs when those expenses are gonna incur. And so I don't think it's really appropriate that we should just divide those number by 12. This, it would give us a little more meaningful information. But on a monthly basis, just wanted to point out that we did spend total expenditures 97% of your monthly expenditures. Uh, so we're in line with, with that. Um, other charts that are included in your packet, this is just the revenue and expense, expenses, uh, looking at it from a bar chart perspective. These are your admin expenses and you can see budget and actual. We've provided you with the contracts that have been signed this month, the budget transfers that were made during the month as well. And then here is our required investment report that we submit. You can see where we are with our uh, allocation of our funds between the different institutions. Our earnings are uh, significantly lower than what we have projected. And as a result, our fiscal year 21 budget, we have reduced that. We had budgeted this year 950,000 in uh, earnings on our investments. That uh, budget for fiscal 21 has been reduced to 650,000, 
we're at 433 year to date for the eight month period. On a percentage basis, you can just look to see where our funds are being held by different institutions. And you can also see the investments by the different categories. So I present that to you and open it up for any questions. Does anybody have any questions of our CFO regarding the uh, financial investment report? Not as to that, but when do we get the certification from the property appraiser? Is that July? That is in July. Okay. Any hints okay. of what it's going to say? Do I know what it's going to say? Hints. It's pretty close to July. Yeah, we're on pins and needles. We're, we're waiting. Okay. Okay, with that good news in, in, in mind, Let's move on to the fiscal 21 budget. Laura, again. Uh, okay, yes. Um, let me find my document here for you. Here we go. So our budget was is prepared, uh, adopted on the foundation of the alignment with JDB strategic plan and its four focus areas. I'm going to... Um, and we, as you know, the primary source of our revenues come from property taxes. We are currently estimating a taxable value property increase of 7.8% over fiscal year 20 and a continued millage rate of 0.8981. Uh, that would give us an increase of approximately 3.8 million on the, uh, the revenue side. This highlights in the agenda packet some of the other uh, items, and I'm going to pull up a couple other items to discuss with you. So I'm not going to go through every item on here. This is a summary page of our proposed budget. As indicated earlier, we are budgeting a 95% collection on the uh, property taxes, as opposed to 97, which it has been for the last uh, several years. That's the lowest amount that we can budget. We think that's reasonable in light of the pandemic as far as what might happen uh, in the future. Our property tax uh, projection right now is at seven, uh, an increase of 7.2%. So net, we would be looking at a 5% increase in our property taxes, which uh, indicated earlier is about a $3.8 million increase. Uh, the 650 is where I indicated earlier, we are proposing a decrease in the uh, interest revenues that we are going to receive uh, and our total when you add our beginning fund balance um, comes in at 110. On the expenditure side uh, you can see the breakdown between our program services relative to our four focus areas between school readiness, school success, prevention of child abuse and neglect, and strengthening community and you can see the differences between our amended budget to date and our proposed budget uh, going forward. Future programming, we're budgeting 1.1 million, which was what we had budgeted in the past. Um, we are uh, hopeful that when the strategic planning meetings occur, which we're trying to schedule those in July, that we'll maybe get some direction and discussion as far as where we would wanna move in utilizing those funds. And the contingency, we have budgeted a million dollars. We started the year with a $500,000 budget. We increased that budget by another 500,000 to a million. And then we have spent that down uh, to 407,000 uh, at this point. Administratively, we're seeing a, a proposed increase of about $100,000. Our non-administrative increases uh, it, it results in the um, commissions fees that we pay, as well as um, internal uh, technology funds that we are proposing in the, in the future. Again, we budget our cash flow reserve of two months and the remaining is our uh, unbudgeted or unreserved um, funds that are available. I'm not gonna go through all of these sheets. You, you have those, but we have provided you with those. I did want to focus a little bit on this presentation. We've changed our presentation for our budget book from what we've done in the past. 
in the past, you've seen two prior years of budgeted amounts and then the uh, projected budget for fiscal 21. What we've done for this budget coming up is we've eliminated this uh, second prior year and we've added a column for comments. So we've included comments, which we hope would be useful in people wanting to read and understand what the increases are. This is broken down by focus area. So this first section here is our school readiness. And you can read through the different um, programs that we are uh, providing based on the different categories. And so just to point out that our school readiness program is right now we're proposing a $12.4 million um, budget, which comes in at 18.22% of our current year program expenses. And in looking back at what that amount was budgeted a year ago, a year ago it was 17.9%. So it's a slight increase in our total program expenses in the school readiness focus area. The next area is your school success. And you can see the different uh, funded agencies and the different programs that we break down into different categories for you. And a lot of time is spent going through these and analyzing those. But for our subtotal here for our school success, we've, uh, we're at 22.1 million. It's a 32.35% of our total program budget. And again, to compare that with last year, it was 32.7. So there's not much change or fluctuation in the uh, school success uh, okay. as well. The third focus area is our prevention of child abuse and neglect. Here you can see again, the different um, programs that we offer, uh, home visiting, mental health, um, and our total subtotal for prevention of child abuse and neglect is 25.4 million, 37.3% of our program budget a year ago, our program budget was 37.4%. So again, about the same. And then our last focus area is strengthening communities. And we've got some different um, uh, programs in here, whether it's uh, food for hunger, uh, the, the uh, NFC programs are in here. And our total for the strengthening community is 8.2 million. 12.14% a year ago, that percentage was 12%. So you can see our change is, is, is pretty moderate with what we've seen in last year's uh, budget. The other two items that I mentioned, the future programming, we're budgeting 1.1 million. Again, hopeful that uh, when we have our uh, strategic plan discussions, we'll be able to get some direction on, on how we can prepare to utilize those funds and our contingency fund, we've uh, budgeted that at 1 million as well. Following these sheets, I'm not gonna go through these, but these are the same information, but it's in, a, it's in an alphabetical uh, format. So it's easier to find something if, if one is interested in looking through there. Uh, our total program expense, 68 versus 70. These are the uh, subschedules as well, again, as I mentioned earlier, our statutory fees are going up. Our internal uh, technology, we've budgeted an increase for that as well. That was on the summary page. And then I wanted to just kind of revisit these forecasts that we have. I wanted to point out that the numbers uh, for the most part have not changed from these sheets that you've seen. I did add a date here on this one because when you look at multiple spreadsheets, you kind of get confused with, do I have the most current one? Uh, so the only thing that's changed on this from the one that you saw before is our amended budget. Numbers have changed due to some small budget amendments. And as a result, our total unassigned balance at the end of the year changed. And that number is what's carried forward to the fiscal year 21 budget. So if you were to compare this with the one that you saw before, you would just see a slight change in the opening fund balance, the subtotals and so forth. All the other numbers have remained the same. And just to remind you that we are using again a 95 percentile uh, collection for fiscal 21. 
All the other years we have uh, utilized a 97% for those items. And let me see here. Um, and uh, pointing out that our interest earnings are um, uh, significantly budgeted in a lower amount. We have budgeted 1.25 in our capital RFA, one time only. The reason for the increase was to set aside some time, some funds that we felt that due to the COVID-19 pandemic that there might be things that uh, the agencies may need to help uh, assist them in moving forward in this environment that we're in relative to um, classrooms and teaching and virtual and, and different things. So we, we did uh, increase that slightly. Um, and then going forward, Let's see here if I can move this. Uh, and the other thing, just to point out here, we did project, you know, different uh, increases in property values based on what we see, which is a four and a half percent increase. No change in the millage rate that would give us these increase in property values, and as well as an increase in our total resources. Spending those funds, we would continue to be mm -hmm. at about a thirty-six percent reserve percentage in fiscal 24. This is a little different from this different second scenario, which is based on the recession. And again, just pointing out that the only numbers that have changed here is your budget column with your fund balance, which has changed your opening fund balance. All the other numbers have remained the same. In the recession scenario, we did not project any additional uh, expenditures in these areas. We are looking at a decrease in property values based on the recession that occurred back in 2008. We utilize those same uh, statistics with decreases in property values and also a change in the millage rate as well. And this is just as we've talked before, you know, worst case scenario, if that in fact were the situation and we wanted to maintain our program expenses pretty much the same level, not increasing a lot of things, cutting back a contingency budget to 500, we would see that our unrestricted reserve would dwindle down to approximately 6%. So just a few things to point out uh, relative to that. Um, and I think that's the last uh, piece in your agenda packet, but I, again, will turn it back over to uh, Chair McCabe for questions and comments. <clears throat> well, I found the notes on the side, the side notes particularly helpful this year. I did have one question though, on cost of living. I may have missed it somewhere in all of it, but you had 1%, 3% and 5%. What was the distinction? That's based on an average lapse percentage. Um, and I think I'll have, Laurie, do you want to speak to that? Yes. Uh all the, it's based on a three year average lap. So uh, I think 5% uh, was less than one and a half percent lapse over three years. 3% um, was between one and a half and four and uh, the 1% 1 was four to 5% lapse. Okay, you're assuming then, or not assuming, but you're looking at it and saying, well, they didn't spend all they had that way they don't need that therefore they don't need that much more correct okay thank you any other questions or comments of laura brock on the proposed budget <clears throat> do we need is that an action item anybody it is it is not an action item but we do need to determine uh if you anticipate or want to discuss a change in the millage rate because that will be at the board meeting <clears throat> You'll be voting on uh, on that. Anybody have the appetite to change the millage rate? None. 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 Okay. <laughs> All right. We won't change the millage rate. Okay. Uh, Laura again. The FEMA you, funds update. You got me again. Okay. So. in the slide one. Okay, so um, I wanted to just give you a, give you an update uh, relative to what's going on with the FEMA uh, funds and monies and funds that are, are available. 
So historically, FEMA, as you know, has dealt with historical disasters. They primarily dealt with hurricanes, you know, floods, fires, uh, damage control, and so forth. So this whole pandemic for them uh, it, it is, a, is a new animal, if you will. Um, let me get my mouse here. Oops. I'm working on two screens here. Trying to get to, trying to well, let's see here. There we go. So uh, funding under the Federal Public Assistance Program now, they have identified the COVID-19 response as an emergency uh, area. So funds are available to eligible participants, applicants, under category B, which is the emergency protective measures. And this is taken in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Through the public assistance program, FEMA is providing assistance to states, territories, tribes, local governments, and certain private um, organizations. So what's the application process? Well, it's, it's pretty tedious and it, it's time consuming, but we've, we've, we've gone through this process. We've gotten, uh, we, we've made, made steps to move in this direction. Applicants are required to begin and register for public assistance through the Florida Division of Emergency Management, the Florida Public Assistance Grants Portal. We have done that and we have been approved as an eligible applicant. You must also register for a project account through FEMA's grant portal. And a project account has been created. And so JDUB is in uh, moving forward, I, like I said earlier, in this process. What happens next is the applicant completes an online streamed COVID-19 application. It's a, it's a pretty tedious area. There's, there's a lot of instruction, a lot of information that has to be uploaded. Uh, and we have already gathered most of the information that we need to be able to do this. Then you would submit to FEMA for review. If approved, the awarded funds would be shown in the applicant's uh, Florida Division of Emergency Management account, and then we would be able to draw down the funds. Once FEMA reviews and approves it or rejects the project, it kind of shifts over to the state, and the state would handle the management side of it. And, and the federal aid government kind of steps away, if you would. So we have looked at the expenses that we've incurred in our contingency fund, and we believe that those are possible eligible expenses, and we have no reason to believe that they would not be approved. Those included the emergency food assistance that we had for food banks, food pantries, the domestic violence capacity, and the telehealth uh, for children's outpage services that we had. So that's uh, approximately 592,462. In addition to that, we've incurred some expenses internally, dealing with gel sanitizers, hand sanitizer stations, uh, funds to our, um, our employees to be able to work remotely in this environment, desks and chairs, scanners, perhaps ink cartridges. So we have gathered all of those expenses as well. It's another $6,400. And then we are also exploring other possible reimbursable expenses based on what they have provided us. We are finding that there are several of them that we would not um, be able to submit. Some of those uh, are in the administrative and, and staff area whereby uh, labor would only be re reimbursed if it was for time spent for overtime. So if you're a regular salaried employee and you're working on that, with exception, however, of the individuals that are working on gathering this information for submission. So we're, we're keeping track of that. We're obtaining the necessary backup that I said. And on top of that, we're staying current with all the changes and the modifications that FEMA is making. That They have webinars that are coming out. I just got an email yesterday with three different more webinars that they're going to offer for individuals to jump on. I did want to point out that we want to be aware of the fact that there is a $750,000 threshold that would kick us into a different audit requirement from our external auditors. The current threshold of expenditures that are made in the fiscal year is $750,000. So if we go over that threshold, that would move us into what's called a single audit. Uh, which is a federal compliance grant compliance audit, 
and the auditors would have to expend uh, a lot more time and energy on that, and that would that would of course result in an additional cost to us. If we find that it would behoove us to move in that direction, we might want to have that discussion. But right now, we're at the 500 plus number, and we just want to be, like I said earlier, uh, cognizant of uh, watching where we are on that. So again, just wanted to keep you informed uh, of that. I uh, didn't know if you have any questions on that. We are about ready to uh, submit our um, project. You can always add to it. You don't have to have the whole project complete and done. Uh, and you can continue to um, add program expenses to that. So questions or comments? My only comment would be, I think your advice is sound that we don't go over the $750,000 threshold. So. Any other comments or questions of Laura regarding the FEMA situation? Just that I agree with you. OK. okay. Seeing, a, seeing a nice nod from Commissioner Steele as well. Uh, OK, now we're back to our CEO for her officer uh, officer's report. And I'll make it brief, but then certainly be available for questions. Um, I would say that uh, there, there, there are two areas that are really um, uh, taking up an additional amount of our time and or are of, of greater concern. Uh, one uh, is that we, we have seen um, a pretty steady rate of COVID cases uh, at our funded agencies, particularly the summer uh, childcare sites not surprising. Um, and it's varied from uh, a child in the program to a sibling, to a staff member, to parents, um, and every, every possible uh, iteration of that. I would tell you that the, um, the health department's epidemiology folks have been amazing in walking through uh, the, the leadership of each of those programs as to exactly what they needed to do given what the exposure was, the time of the exposure, who was exposed and that sort of thing. So the answers are not all totally cookie cutter, uh, but it has been, um, uh, and, and Judith is gonna give a, a broader report on this at the board meeting. I would just say, um, I think we, we assisted our agencies before they opened significantly in knowing what all the best practices were. Uh, they also had the benefit when summer started of hearing from the, the two YMCAs and from uh, Boys and Girls Club who had uh, been caring for uh, uh, the uh, first responders children from the beginning of, of this outbreak. And so they learned a lot of, you know, there were lessons learned from those. And we, in weekly phone calls, all of our providers were able to hear those. So I think they've, they've done a very, very good job, uh, but it's, it's, it's just the nature of, of the beast, so to speak. Um, the, the, uh, the second, uh, significant concern we have and, and we're taking action in a variety of ways is uh, the impending uh, lift of the moratorium on evictions. And uh, we are assisting our agencies that touch that in one way or another. And we're also providing significant assistance everywhere we can to the county's program. So uh, that, that runs from uh, providing all of our conference rooms to the 211 and the and significant number of county staff who are who have come to the 211 location to assist with this process, um, as well as uh, having our our uh, neighborhood family centers be locations that the navigators that normally work on the FSI program are assisting families with the Pinellas Cares program. Um, and, and all of those folks are, are extremely well equipped to assist families in getting documents they don't know how to get. And then there's a physical place, all those things can be scanned and sent in, which streamlines the process 
uh, certainly for the family as well as for 211 in the county. Um, but we, we are well aware that there are, there are surely still significant numbers of families as well as individuals who, when this uh, moratorium is lifted, um, are, are going to potentially owe one to three to four months rent um, and, and not have the funds to pay it. Um, there is a, a significant effort by the, um, by the Resilience Fund, which is, uh, I'm going to forget somebody, but uh, the Pinellas Community Foundation, uh, uh, Community Foundation of Tampa Bay, um, the Foundation for Healthy St. Pete, and um, the, um, okay, somebody help me, uh, United Way as well as Allegheny Franciscan Ministries are working together. They approached us at the beginning of this, but it was not the kind of thing we could turn over our money to a fund that would be decided jointly by others. So we have walked beside them and been, been assistive. That group is working particularly with the, uh, the legal aid community to, um, to work on eviction, uh, eviction avoidance. Uh, where they can. So there are a variety of people working on this issue in different ways. I'll, I'll stop there and just be available for questions. And of course, we'll, we'll talk about some of these things again at the board meeting. Do, do you have any numbers on the uh, child care facilities about how prevalent the... Well, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a moving number. Judith, how many do we have roughly right now? So roughly today, as of today, we've got 28 incidents throughout our programs. And that would have been um, from the beginning of the-, the beginning. Yeah. And I have had conversations with the licensing board. And I think in the first three weeks, they saw um, at least 12 incidents a week, 10 to 12. And this is when the summer opened up? Yeah, June 1st. Judith, isn't some of those incidents not necessarily the participant or the child, but it could be a parent of the child that's in the program? So it's uh, most of them are the child or the um, or the um, most of them are the child or the staff. I'll be honest. There's a few where they've um, brought up parents, but for the most part, the health department, you know, is deferring those. I will say, if I were to say, um, the health department's doing a fabulous job. Um, I, what I learned yesterday is they only have two staff that are assigned to kind of working with this group um, settings. And so if there's one issue, it just may take a minute for them to get back with them. But overall, the epidemiology has been doing an outstanding job. And that, if my understanding, they're not necessarily all having to close. It's a case by case situation yes. according to what the specific incident is. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we've only had one incident where the whole centers had to close because the groups are so good at keeping their cohorts together, right. Right. then it has been a classroom. The one that experienced the full closure was related to somebody that was giving food out. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions for our CEO? Hearing none, I guess we move to the open agenda. Anybody have anything for the good of the order? And hearing none, Laura, anybody want on the, out in the world want to say something? I do not see anybody out in the world wanting to say something. Okay, anybody have anything? So our if next, not, our, next Laura, finance, our next finance meeting will be August 18th. Uh, which will be after the July meeting. So I just want to make sure that that's on everyone's calendar. Thank you. Anything else? If not, we stand adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.